Okay. Va'etza yitzur levata lagava. Now that we know that the greatest problem, the greatest impediment to my being happy, to my feeling meaning in my life, to my feeling connected to others, to my experiencing real true joy is the ego. Now Rabbi Nachman says, so what's the Eitzah? How do I overcome this thing? Not just for those people that I know that they are exerting that ego upon me, but that me myself, Rabbi Nachman is trying to get you to realize that you have an element of this. So what's the Eitzah? Shehi HaVodazar. First you need to know that arrogance, ego, is not just some negative midah. It's not just some quality that gets and interferes with your life. He says, literally, this is the concept of foreign worship. Why? So he brings a pasuk from Mishle, the Shlomo Melech. He says, Tovat, which usually they translate like abhorrence, Tav Hashem, anyone whose heart is haughty, arrogant. Okay, I mean. But he brings this Gemar from Masechet Sota, Daf Dalet, which is trying to explain that Hashem and a person who's arrogant, they can't dwell together. So what's the reason? The reason is very, very simple. And by the way, it's a very interesting thing. Targum Onkelos, he explains this word tovat in the Torah when he's describing what it means, the basic translation of tovat, which usually we say like it's like an abomination, it's like an abhorrence. Like when I hear this word, I like, I, I get anxious, I don't even know what it means. And like, it's, it just sounds very scary. And like this thing, Hashem thinks this is an abomination. And what is an abomination? So Targum Onkelos says very simply, it's foreign. It's something that's like, it, it's foreign. It's, it's, not, um, it's not true. So now it makes amazing uh, a connection here because a vodazar, which means what? Foreign worship. And what is this to Hashem? This is tovat Hashem. This is something that is off for Hashem. This is something which is foreign to Hashem. The concept of a person whose heart is haughty. Ha'ikr hu ayyadeh hitkarvut l'tzadikim. The Eitzah is to draw close to Tzadikim. Kamuva B'Tikunim, like it's brought in Tikuni Zohar. It brings here this concept of the Shofar Blast with the Trua. There's three different main sounds of the Shofar. One of them is called Trua. Trua is the broken sounds, not the quick staccato. I think they call it staccato, which is like da 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 But the slower ones, that's still broken. It's not one long stream sound, but it's... Mm, Trua, okay? The Tikkuni Soar says that this sound of Trua, the Ihu Rucha, this is the concept of Ruach. This is the concept of life force. This is the concept of spirit. And what does spirit do? What does wind do? Itavir Kel Acher. It removes this foreign God. Now, what's this foreign God? When we think about Avodah Zara, and people say, oh, you over avoid a Zara. What is that? You over avoid a Zara. Now you think that means worshiping Jesus. Or you think that means going to the ashram and, uh, you know, bowing down to some, you know, Dalai Lama Buddhist, you know, something. Rabbi Nachman is bringing this Gemara to show you that's not avoid That comes after avoid what is a vodazar? A vodazar is that you worship yourself. You serve yourself. Everything you do is to serve yourself. Your thoughts are self-serving. Your emotions are self-serving. Your actions are self-serving. Everything that you're doing is self-serving. That's called a vodazar. That's called foreign worship. It doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's foreign because it doesn't make any sense. It's like if, uh, you know, someone has asked me, uh, you know, what, how can you say, like, I shouldn't be able to understand something that's real. If, I, if it's real, I should be able to understand it. I was like, if you go into a forest and you see a little bug, and you see you're doing hippo dude outside, and you see this little tiny ant at the top of a leaf. If you were to ask that ant, what's the meaning of life? Or how big is the world? What is the ant going to tell you? The 
ant's going to tell you it's as big as whatever he can see right in front of him, right? Now, because the ant is so small, and he's on top of this leaf, this is his whole worldview, this is his whole perspective. Now, if you look at that leaf, it's only one of, let's say, 30 leaves on top of this plant. This plant is one plant amongst thousands of plants on this field. And this field, where all these plants are, is only one small path between two sides of one neighborhood. And this neighborhood is a very small neighborhood, which is part of a larger municipality, a larger town, which is part of a larger city, which is part of a state, which is part of a country, which is part of a continent. And this continent is only one of seven continents which is surrounded by gigantic oceans, which take up 70% of the world, whereas the land only takes up 30%, just like your body. And this is just the physical world that we live in on Earth. And then you have the planets outside of Earth. And then you have the stars, and you have trillions of light years. And that's only in our solar system. And then there's like black holes, and apparently there's other places you can go to. Right? So this... Now imagine that little tiny ant trying to figure out his life. What is life? How is life? And if you and that ant says to you, I should be able to understand. I should be able to understand. Why shouldn't I be able to understand? If it's the truth, I should be able to understand it. Otherwise, it's something crazy. It's a cult. So part of it sounds like it's coming from a good place. The place of, I don't want to invest myself in something which is not real, and therefore, I need to be able to understand this thing every aspect of it. But there's a very deep-rooted thing which is underneath there, which is called, I think that I'm much, much, much bigger than I am. And because I think I'm much, much bigger than I am, I misunderstand how little that I know. And that's interfering now with every aspect of my life. The Torah, it wants you to resonate, obviously, with it as the truth. And you need to be able to connect to the truth of the Torah. However, once you connect to it, you have to also know that there is a tremendous limit to the amount that you can actually understand. And the reason is not because um, Hashem is trying to cover things over for you and not have you be able to understand. It's just very, very simple. We are very, very, very small. Unless the person thinks to themselves, well, I don't want to live a life where I'm very, very small. Everything in my life, I'm trying to make it that I'm very, very big. That's going to be a good life. But that's what's interfering with everything. Because once you're very, very small, then everything's amazing. I don't mean amazing in the sense like everything is fun. I mean like it's amazing. Like if you ever went to the desert in the south of Israel at nighttime and you see a million stars and you see you're in this huge sand dune and you're like, you feel like a speck of existence, it's awesome. It's the most awesome feeling. You're just like, oh my gosh, there's like something very big and cosmic is going on. And I'm like this little speck of that thing. Doesn't mean I'm not important. Maybe I'm the whole center of it, but it's, 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 it's very small. To the degree that you think that you're big, to that degree, your life loses all of its luster. It loses all of its excitement. When you're with your kids, when you're with your wife, when you're at work, when you're um, learning, when you're davening, to the degree that you think that you're big, to that degree, everything becomes small. And you don't enjoy it. But if you come into Lukut Imran, like uh, I'm in the middle of a desert in the south of Israel, and I realize that what Rabbi Nachman's speaking about is like all those stars in the sky. And you look at it from that place. You're like, wow, I'm like subsumed in the light of God. It's something very, very big and beautiful. I'm so happy to become consumed and subsumed and nullified in this thing. It's not uh, antithetical to your existence. It is your existence. But the Yetzirah is to make you want to think that you're all that there is and you're alone and nobody's taking care of you and you have to fend for yourself in everything that you do and everything is a threat to your ego when people insult you when your kids don't listen to you 
when your job, uh, your boss is yelling at you, and uh, when you go to learn, and then you're like, you know, these people are learning all this stuff and I can only learn this little bit. It's all coming from a place of the Yetzirah, trying to make you feel that your smallness is a problem. But when you accept the smallness, and you learn to love the smallness, and you realize it's not a barrier, it's the key. Moshe Rabbeinu was the wisest man who ever lived. Rabbi Nachman says, what made Moshe Rabbeinu be capable of leading the Jewish people and achieving this highest level of consciousness? It was the fact that he thought that every single Jew was greater than him. He really didn't understand why he was like fitting to be the leader. And when he saw anybody else, he really felt like they would do a better job than him. That's why he was able to connect to God and experience God at such a high level. It's this experience of being able to have humility. That humility is what allows you to connect to something very, very big. How do you get there? Rabbi Nachman says, easy. Come close to tzaddikim. Why? Because listen to what the Tukhuni Zohar said. The tzaddik hu bechinat rucha. Because the tzaddik is the concept of rucha, which means ruach. He's the concept of spirit, life, joy, feeling, experience, ruach. Ruach means so many different things, but it's like everything that we're all looking for. It's ruach. Kamosha How do we know that the tzaddik is most directly correlated to ruach, to life force? Ish asher ruach bo. Because when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, you're not going to bring the Jewish people into Eretz Yisrael. So Moshe said, then somebody's going to have to replace me that has Ruach in him. Why? It means he's a tzaddik. Rabbi Nachman said, what are you going to find in Breslov that you can't find anywhere else? Ruach. Now this is a very, very important thing. For a few reasons. One, where did Yahushua get this Ruach from? So the end of this Pasuk says that Moshe put his hands on his head. Meaning, what made Yahushua have this Ruach that he's able to lead the Jewish people, that he's able to be a Tzaddik? It's the fact that he was close to Tzaddikim. So we learn from Yahushua, how do you get Ruach? How is it that Hashem literally says on Yahushua, he's got Ruach? By being close to Moshe. Why? Because what we're going to see from this Torah, Moshe is Ruach. Moshe is the Ruach that's in your heart when it's inflamed, when it's on fire. That Ruach that makes you want to get close to Hashem, want to learn, want to pray, want to do Ipo to do, want to connect to Jewish people, want to be your best self, that Ruach that makes you feel joy, that makes you feel energized, that's called Moshe. How does Moshe get in? This is what we're going to have to learn. But Moshe is that Ruach. And it's through drawing close to Tzaddikim that the Ruach Gavoha, this not the Ruach of the Tzaddik, not this Ruach of life force, not this Ruach of Kedusha, which is the Ruach of godliness, which, which is literally Ruach HaKodesh. Meaning, it's not a spirit which is drawn from my limited self. It's a, it's a spirit which is drawn from something divine. It's drawn from pure godliness. It's drawn from the Ein Sof. That's the Ruach that we're looking for. And when that Ruach enters into me, automatically the Ruach of ego dissipates. It goes away. So you can kind of imagine it like as a picture. You have already, naturally, because this is the Yetzahar. Again, Rabbi Nachman's trying to break it down so it's not some uh, esoteric, abstract reality. What is my Yetzahar? Ruach Shtut, the Gemara says. What is Ruach Shtut? That you think that you're God. What's a greater craziness than that? Are you going to say, oh, I don't think I'm God. I don't think I'm anything. I, like, I don't even like myself. <laughs> so you don't realize that's coming from believing that you are alone. And that you are the center of your own reality. And you're not connected to anything greater than you. It's coming from arrogance. It's a crazy thing. This is a principle of Hasidus. Where does low self-esteem come from? We spoke about this last class. Low self-esteem comes from thinking about yourself. 
as soon as you start to think a lot about yourself, automatically your self-esteem starts to dip. The more that you think about yourself, the more your self-esteem goes away. Why? Because yourself is limited. So the more that you're invested in it, the more limited you become. When you say think about yourself, you... Can I elaborate? Yeah. So when I'm saying thinking about yourself, thinking about myself as a... Um, that I exist in a vacuum, in that sense, right? Um, I'm alone. Nobody's taking care of me. Nobody's uh, watching over me. There's no mashkiach in the world. There's no bore olam. There's nobody who's my abba in shemayim. Nobody's taking care of me, right? Automatically, what does that mean? That means that I have to fend for myself. I have to make things happen. I have to make moves. I have to do this. I have to protect myself. When people insult me, I have to respond. Why? Because if I don't, then people are going to walk all over me. And if people walk all over me, what's going to happen? Well, if I'm the only cause of my existence, then I'm just going to die. And guess what? Nobody wants to die. But what if I don't have to protect myself? Because Hashem Shomer Yisrael. I don't have to worry about it. Right, so it, it's not Kaifa Bet Yadi, but you still, you still, like Hashem gave you tools to do things. That's all good. So when I'm saying thinking about yourself, I don't mean that you, uh, you stop thinking about how you can achieve your mission in your life. I don't mean you're not thinking about how to utilize the kohot that Hashem gave you to serve Him. But the purpose has to be something greater than you in what you're doing. So, like, this is a good example. Yeah. Like, there has to be a greater purpose to my thinking about myself. If I'm thinking about myself, meaning my kohot, so I can figure out how I can serve Hashem in my life, perfect. Now you took your, um, your own bechina and you absorbed it, you mavatled it within the Ein Sof. And that's beautiful. And that's where joy comes from. But as soon as it becomes disconnected, there's no greater reason, there's no greater cause, there's no greater motivation for the thing that I'm doing. That's the cause of what we're talking about, the ego. So you're saying just do anything to stop without, yeah. without attaching to a higher purpose in everything that you do. Yeah. It doesn't have to mean you have to open up a chesed organization. It could just be, it could simply be that no. I have to use my energy for making sure my wife is, you know, happy and my children are getting the chesed of or whatever it is. Yeah, it's just a, it's a great, it's just a greater motivation for what, like, what does it mean to be a chesed? And like, I've, I've thought about it a lot, like over the years, and I, and I realize it boils down to one thing. Trust in A chesed means you're on a mission. That's what it means. I'm on a mission. You'll notice, why is it that Hasidut will encourage Jews, religious, Haredi, Torah observant, ultra-Orthodox as they call them, to go out into the secular world and to be mashpia, to try and give over this gift that they feel that they have to others. Whereas the other aspect of that Jewish world feels like that's the greatest risk, that's the greatest sakana, you're literally putting you and your family into a situation in which uh, everybody's vulnerable to all outside influences. And therefore, what would be the greatest uh, use of the gifts that Hashem gives me and the resource to insulate? So they're not wrong, except for this one point. Why are Hasidim able to go out and they're not affected? They just affect others. Why is it that Lubavitch can go anywhere and they affect them, and they're not affected. Anyone want to guess? I don't. I don't, I don't know, know Lubavitch, but I know Rabino talks about it. Saying about the steps. Yeah. What do you say? Uh, Rabino has a Torah on being careful when you're being the kind of others. That if you're connected to the tzaddik, then then it's shmira. Why? Probably because you're not doing it for yourself. You're being his extension. And therefore, what does that mean? I don't want to just guess. I mean, I can, I can guess probably. No, you're right. You're right. I'm saying it's all one thing. It's all one thing. Why are breast lovers, like Rabbi Nachman saying, even if you're not the tzaddik emet, as long as you're connected to him, you can now go chutzah, 
right? Or by Lubavitch, your it's just you're on shliach, you're going, and uh, so what's the what is it that protects you? Why are you protected? You're under his wing. You're on a mission. You're on a mission. If you'll notice, just go through it in your hipotidu, your next hipotidu. When do I do things that are destructive to myself? I forget my purpose. I don't forget what I'm doing. When I'm not, when what I'm doing, there's no mission. That's it. I'm not on a mission. And a mission doesn't have to be something divine. Just a mission. Right? Like I, I tell people, when you go to the bathroom, don't just go to the bathroom. Say, I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> Train yourself to be a chassid in everything that you do. To be on a mission. Be on a mission. Don't just go do things, because you know what happens? Then you're under the dominion of the Sitra Akhra. Every, yeah, they're Sephardi. He's like, yeah, I like that. Okay. Because this is the whole thing. Your Shmira, your ability to always stay high, your ability to always stay connected, your ability to thrive in everything you do is to be on a mission. It's being on a mission. That's what makes you a Chassid. That's why Chassidim are so matzliach in helping others and growing spiritually. It's because they're on a mission. So that's obviously what I'm sure a big part of he voted is, is keeping you Connect it's the whole thing. It's it's the whole it's the whole entire thing. Retapping into it. Like Retapping into it. Re it out. Yes. It's the it's the it's the whole thing. Just remembering. I need to be on a mission. On a mission, right? Like, don't just walk in the door when you come back from work and you feel like crap. And you're like, you're about, you know what's going to happen. You're going to walk in. Your wife's going to be like not happy. And your kids are going to be not listening to you. And then I'm going to explode on everybody. And like, I do this every night. And I tell myself I'm not going to. And then I come in and I do it again. Okay. Before you walk in the house, just take a second. Don't just walk in the house. Because now you're vulnerable to all the outside influences. How do you insulate yourself? So you not only are protected, but you can be much beyond on those people. Which is what you're supposed to be doing. That's what we're here. You have to go into your house on a mission. I'm gonna go now spend time with my kids. Not just that it's gonna happen to me. I'm going to do that. With everything. When you go to sleep at night, don't just take out your phone, you're starting to put on the alarm, but then you start to go on YouTube and you watch seven hours of something, like... Why is that happening? Cats are really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that happening to me? There's only one reason. Because when I went to sleep, I wasn't on a mission. I wasn't on a mission to go to sleep. I just lay down in bed. But if I say before I go to sleep, I say, I'm going to sleep now. That's what I'm going to do now. I'm on a mission to go to sleep. You'll be able to just set your alarm and go to sleep. You have to be on a mission. Everything that you do, you're on a mission. This is a chasid. And this is how you're not only matzliach in each thing that you do, but you're protected from all the outside influences. Okay? Ba'ayadeh nikhna ruach kavoha. El acher. V'nase me'acher echad. So Rabbi Nachman brings a tikkuni Zohar. It says an amazing thing. Ki hu kotze da ot dalet shemeno arba ruchot. Like this. When you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, this is the proclamation of Amuna. This is the proclamation of faith. This is the mitzvah d'oraita to say in the morning and at night. It's a very big thing. If you read the re teachings of the Arizal, it says something amazing. He says that uh, the four elements of Yud Kei Vav Kei that you're tapping into in the morning when you go pray Shachri. Okay, what are they? You have tefillah itself. That's the hey in Hashem's name. Then you have your tzitziot. Tal katan, tal gadol. That's the vav in Hashem's name. Then you have the tefillin. That's the upper hey in Hashem's name. So what's the yud? Kriyat Shema. Opa. Kriyat Shema. Very deep thing. Kriyat Shema is very big. Okay, Kriyat Shema. Now, now, now Tikkun brings an amazing, amazing point. But first, 
first hay is tefillin? No, the, the, second hay is the higher hay is tefillin, the lower hay is tefillin. Prayer. And if that is the I'm saying the, 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 the tzitzit. K, the, K, you, you, the first hay is... Is you're looking at it top down? Like you're it, okay however you want to look at it. If you want to look at top down, it's... Shema? Okay. Shema. Okay. I originally st- I started from the bottom. Yeah. Shema, okay, so Shema. You know, started from the, from the bottom, now we're here. Oh. <laughs> Why are you laughing? No, that's not... <laughs> that's not <laughs> secular, that's secular so music. So <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, good. The bottom... Bottom is the lower hay. That's tefillah. That's prayer, right? Everything Rabbi Nachman says, malchut, prayer, tefillah, lower hay. The vav is tzitzit. Why? It's the brit. It's the covenant. Tzitzit. It's the vav. It's the connection point. Okay, beautiful. Then you have tefillin. Tefillin is the upper hay. It's bina. And then chokhmah is kriyat shema. Now on a deeper level, the Eitzhayim, or this is actually the pre speaks about how um, when you're saying Kriyat Shema, you're literally making a yichud in the place which is called, the world is called Ava, or the partzuf which is called Ava. It's the highest uh, yichud that you affect in your uh, whole shachri. But you don't get to access it until you pray the Amidah. So like you're making some type of yichud, with, meaning you're, you're hitting the highest point in Kriyat Shema, but you don't actually get to draw down that light and experience it, except through the Amidah. So the Amidah, you hit lower Yichudim, you hit lower... Uh, like it's in the chamber, but hasn't been triggered yet or something like that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're hitting the highest at the Shema, but you access it in the Tefillah. Okay. So in a, in a way, Tefillah is the highest, right? The Amidah is the highest, because that's what like unlocks the whole thing, and that's what connects the whole thing. But the actual highest point is the Kriyat Shema. Okay? You're making a very, very deep Yichud at that point. Now, what, what is it? So, one element of it is you say, Shema Yisrael Shem Elokeinu Shem Echad. So, Tikkun Yizohar brings the fact that, what is Echad? Echad is Aleph, Chet, Dalet. The Aleph is Gematria 1. The Chet is Gematria 8. Now, uh, in Tikkun Yizohar, they explain that the Aleph and the Chet, which is n- nine altogether, right? One plus eight is nine, right? You were math genius in school, right? No, no. It's, just, it's just the glasses. Okay, so that's nine. And what are those nine referring to? So those nine are referring to the nine Svirot, which are part of the Partsuf of Zer Enpin. Okay? Nine? Yes. Why? From Yesod all the way up to Chochma. Okay, so it's like Yesod, Hod, Netzach, Tiferet, Gevura, Chesed, Da'at, Bina, Chochma. I thought, I don't know, I thought the Zerampin is just from after Bina. Below just Bina. The, 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 the Vav cuts the Tzavah. The Zerampin. Ah. Right, the, from, yeah, from Tiferet, basically. Right, so this, so the, um, the Svi wrote and the Partsuf, the, the, the writings of the Ariza are mamish like, um, like, Chemistry. <laughs> They're not like Hasidut at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's mamish like science. Um, and everything is relative. You know, this is like a very right, important so, point. So yes, when you learn about the Vav, you learn about Tiferet, it's only the six Firot. Okay? But that Vav is corresponding to a part Suf, which the, one of the big Chidushim of the Ariza that he unfolds and reveals is this concept of part Sufim, or systems in Kabbalah how these spheroids interact with each other. So the part suf, which is most uh, connected to the letter vav, is called zer enpin. Now in the part suf itself, there's nine spheroids. Even true. because there's one lower one, which is nukva. When we think of nukva, we think of a separate part suf altogether. But the truth is that in, 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 the, same in, the, in the writings of the Ari, it's called the nukva of Zer Enpin. There is no really nukva of itself. That's why it has no light of its own, because it doesn't exist in and of itself. The issue is that once the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, so now Zer Enpin and nukva, they have a separation now between them. So why is that so problematic? Because nukva has no light of its own. It's actually a part of Zer Enpin. 
So once there is this destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, now there's no way to unite to make a yichud between Zerim and Nukva, even though they're always really truly connected. Within the parts of... Within Zerim. the parts of, right. So now, when you're saying Shema, you're actually connecting them. How is that? Because you have the Aleph, which is one, you have the Chet, which is eight. Altogether, you have the nine Svirot of this part Tzuf called Zerenpin. The Dalit is referring, Rabbi Nachman brings this up many times, to the, to the Nukva. Okay? The Dalit is David, the Dalit is the Nukva, the Dalit is the Malchut, right? Four directions, right? Like this uh, physical delayed. world. Dalit has nothing of its own, yeah. right? So there's a, a lot of beautiful... Um, also, oh, it's like a pale, right? A pale has nothing of its own. You lift it up. Okay, beautiful. So the Dalit is always Nukva. What am I doing when I say Echad and I don't even realize it? You're making a Yichud between Zerah and Pen and Nukva. But at the highest level. At the highest level. In the highest level of which parts of? Abba. <laughs> of Abba. Yeah. This is Zerah and Pen of Abba. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's very, very complicated. Anyway. Dummy's no, guy. So dummy's guy to Kabbalah. Yeah. <laughs> That was in, that's what it means to make the yichud in, in, in that place, okay? Right. So now, what's the problem? The problem is that the Dalit looks a lot like a Resh. What's the only difference? There's only one difference between a Dalit and a Resh. The it's the Kites. What's the Kites? It's, it's the corner. Right corner. It's a little dot. That little dot in the top right corner is what differentiates a Dalit from a Resh. So you're going to say, okay, this sounds like semantics. Who cares if there's a little dot there and it's a Dalit or a Resh? Well, you know what happens to this Dalit if it's a Resh? Then you're saying, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Acher. <laughs> Hashem Acher. So instead of saying Hashem is one, which is the principle of Amunah, it's the whole entire, uh, this is the whole thing. We believe Hashem is one. We believe that all of existence is one. We believe that it's all connected. It's all a systematic and joined at the hip, and there's heat kashrut, and there's um, deep, 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 deep unity, which permeates all of existence, right? That's what we're saying with echad. But acher represents the opposite. It means that there's disunity. It means that everything's disconnected. Okay? So when we say Hashem echad, right, the Gemara says that you should pronounce the Dalit and make sure that you bring out the Dalit, and this is brought down in the Shulchan Aruch, right? You have to actually pronounce out the Dalit. Why? So it doesn't sound like a Resh. Because that's the antithesis. But, but we're learning something very, very important here. You, you, if you're not connected to this, the, the codes of the Dalit, it's automatically a Resh. That's why, that's why that it's like this. It's to teach you that as long as I'm not actively connected to Echad, which is a Muna, which we're going to learn that the coats of the Dalit is the point, is the Yisod of the Tzaddik. That is that point. That foundation is what makes it from a Resh to a Dalit. Okay? And this is the secret of why Rabbi Nachman brings Hikashu to Tzaddikim is the Iker in every single lesson. Because it what, it's what brings Acher to Echad. And why is, what am I saying that, that, that I'm trying to say is very fundamental? You're either connected to unity or you're connected to atheism. And there is no in-between. It's echad, or, and if I don't have that little code, it's acher. Right? These four tzaddikim went up to, um, to Pardes. Three of them came down, not so good. Only Rabbi Akiva went in in peace and came out in peace. Who's the one who came in and became an atheist after? His name is Acher. Acher. Why? Because he couldn't stay attached to the Kotz Shel Dalit, to the point of the Tzaddik. And what happens? Automatically, you become an atheist. Acher. Now, we're not talking about this in order, like we're not speaking about it in terms of oh, I should feel bad about myself or I'm going to be punished. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about what's my quality of life. Quality of life comes from being connected. That's where Ruach comes in. When I'm connected, then the Ruach of Kedusha, the Ruach of life can enter into my heart and that brings joy. That joy then permeates into my hands and my feet and I clap and I dance because I'm happy, right? But how do I let that thing in? 
using, using someone who still has not holding on the guy, but he won't let himself clap and dance. He can't. He can't. His hands and his feet are heavy. I mean, it's taking me, it's taking me a while, to, like, and he voted to like, I find a little spot, I'm like, <laughs> like it's, it's hard. Yeah. Like, it's really, it feels weird. It's yeah. awkward. But like, I'm slowly getting there, like, get you, But you know what doesn't feel weird? Being miserable. Yeah. That's for sure. Isn't that weird? Isn't it weird that it's not weird to feel miserable? That's like, okay. Remember, no, like, I remember, I, I, I think I told you guys this, but I was in America, I was by my parents' house, and I was, uh, you know, at this point, you know, every time I come home, I'm a little bit more brave in terms of revealing the levels to which I've joined this uh, secret agent force called Breslau of Kassidim. And, you know, so each time I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to go, uh, you know, go alone for a little bit. Oh, I'm doing this thing called Deepo to do it. Oh, I'm talking to God. You know, each time a little bit, a little bit more, uh, you know, it's like exposure therapy. And then uh, this last time that I was there a couple times ago, um, I said to my parents, uh, I, I think I'm you know, doing a boat dude in the in the woods in the back of our house. You know, my, I lived in the same house my whole life, New Jersey, um, and there's woods in the back, and never really went in those woods, and I just always assumed it was part of my property. So I went in the woods, and the whole week I was there, every single day he's boat dudes. But you know, you go through ebbs and flows. Sometimes you're supposed to do this. His mom is like, you're on fire, and you feel amazing, and you feel enlivened. Sometimes you're supposed to do this like. You feel broken and like you don't know how you're gonna go on, you know. But this week happened to be like the first first variety. I was like literally feeling on fire. I was out there and I was clapping and I was dancing and I was singing and I was screaming to Hashem and I was doing like all types yeah, of that's just part of this. Yeah. <laughs> Sound like stories, you know, where you hear like the, the Baal Shem Tov that he's going through these different emotions, you know, he's going from like his face is like like this, and then he starts to smile. You know, it's like that, like that whole schizophrenic uh, spiritual experience that uh, you know most people will have you. Um, what's the word? Locked up. For Locked up for. But, but apparently, in the Jewish world, it's like the epitome of existence to, to get to this point. Holy schizophrenia. So I'm in this holy schizophrenic state, and the uh, he bought a dude outside. And after a week there of doing this, I'm like towards the end of the week and I'm going to go home soon after that. And all of us, and I keep my eyes closed always, like, unless something happens for the whole hour. Because it helps me to enter into the bitl more. That less, also have ADD, so like it's just, you know, everything that bothers me and like gets interferes. So like the less stimulus I have, better. So for like, I'm, I'm an hour in and by the end, the mom is smiling, I'm beaming, like I have that breast of smile, you know, like from Uman with the 70 year old guy with no teeth in his standing, mouth. You usually say you're standing up for that hour? Uh, it depends. Usually I'm sitting and then like when my legs start to hurt because I've been sitting too long, I stand and then I'll sit again. But it's not, uh, not Ikar, it doesn't make a difference. I know a lot of people that they walk the whole time they do it. A lot of people, they sit the whole time they do it. Most of it, I'm sitting. Um, and then all of a sudden I start to hear rustling in the woods. So I'm like, I'm not gonna open my eyes. I have a Muna, I'm not scared of anything. And I hear the rustling getting you know, louder. And I hear it's like, tick, 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 and it feels like it's getting close to me. I'm like, is this like? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I think maybe a Muna dictates I should look. You know, like, so I'm not in this, I'm in a Sakana, like, for no reason, you know, maybe I should look, maybe there's, like, a wild hyena right behind me, he's about to mosh eat me, so, I'm like, you know, nobody told me I'm not allowed to open my eyes, I, like, I impose this on myself, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna open my eyes and look, and I see a, a police ranger officer, big, hefty, beer belly, you know, buttoned up, too short, too, too tight for his, his body tight for some reason, they, that's how they, they always get them, and they... He's walking in and he looks at me and he goes, and as soon as I see him, he sees that I see him and he goes, don't move. Uh, I was like, okay. And I had a bottle of water in my hand. So he goes, what you got over there? <laughs> Gosh. I, Even if it was vodka, I can, I can drink vodka in the, in the woods if I want to. Yeah, but the, but, but the, the, schizo the Jewish schizophrenic mystic experience I was having yeah. would lend itself to it being vodka, in which case I'm inebriated, and that's why I'm acting like that. That would be the, I guess that would be the problem. So I said, uh, what, this? And as soon as I said this, he goes, drop it right now. <laughs> I was like, you mean the water? The Poland Spring water bottle I have? He goes, yeah. No funny stuff. So <laughs> I dropped it, the bottle goes on the floor. 
he, he goes, don't move, and he picks it up. This is just water. <laughs> Detective guy. I, 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 Disappointing. I, I, he's like, this isn't like that cop show I watched last night when I was hyping myself up to do this job today. So then uh, I was like, yeah, that, that's right. I was, that's what I told you. I was drinking Poland Spring water. He goes, all right, not, not, not so quick with all your responses right now. I'm the one asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, shoot, okay. shoot first then. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, okay, listen, um, I got a phone call over the past few days. Some, some uh, foreign entity has been uh, in the woods for an hour at a time and making very loud noises and people have looked outside and seen shades of dancing and scre <laughs> scre <laughs> screaming, screaming and um, talking to himself. Just like, um, is that you? I said, um, I said, based on the description, yeah, it's, it sounds like what I've been doing. <laughs> he, he goes, uh, well, why are you doing that? I said, uh, I'm, I'm meditating. He goes, what do you mean you're, me what, what do you mean meditating? He goes, what, what type of meditation is that? I said, this is my meditation. Every day I come outside and I talk to God. And, uh, and, and, and part of that is me dancing, part of that is me, t you know, talking, part of that sometimes me screaming, you know, um, the whole pan panorama of, of, of experience. <laughs> so he goes, you're telling me that every day you take an hour and you talk to God and amidst that hour, you dance and you clap and you, and you sing <laughs> when and you, you, say it like and that, you yeah. scream <laughs> and, uh, and you talk and you do this every day for an hour. I said, uh, yeah, if I have the merit, yeah. He goes, and you're saying that's your med that's your daily meditation? And I said, yeah. He goes, don't you think that's weird? <laughs> <laughs> I said, he no, but I could see how you would. <laughs> <laughs> and then whatever, you know, it was, it was actually very funny because he goes, oh, I, I got a phone call from somebody. Um... And I see a guy behind him who's not a cop, who's right behind him, like a little tiny, very suspicious looking, you know, looks Old like Yeta, a homeowner home looking type of person, like, you know, with the polo shirt on and Lock like, him up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't believe him. The, so, so he, he goes, yes, yeah, someone, I got an anonymous phone call from somebody. <laughs> Telling me, complaining about this person who's screaming, whatever, in the woods. And I see, like, the guy behind him, he's, like, red and he's sweating. I was like, are you talking about the guy who's right behind you? <laughs> he goes, no, not him. And the guy's like... <laughs> uh, anyway, session was cut short. So I, I missed about, like, five to ten minutes of my boat and I never got to an hour. So I went home. He, he realized I wasn't drunk. He realized there was no alcohol. He realized I wasn't a threat. He realized I meant actually what I was saying. He was you know, intrigued and like disturbed, you know, like kind of like this whole mixture of experiences. <laughs> <laughs> and I went back to my house and I continued. I did the last 10 minutes in my basement in the closet. And, and I spent the last 10 minutes thinking about this. And I was like, that, what's the chokhmah in this? I was on that tour. I was walking with that. It's a chokhmah in there. There's some type of chokhmah in that experience. Why did Hashem interrupt the last 10 minutes? That this cop should come here. It's always a cop. It's always a cop. Every time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you time I came across New York scooters? A, a lot, a few times. They yeah. just pull, like, if you're doing it at night, middle of the night, you're walking around and you're, you know, dressed a little shady or whatever. Because the Yates are hard, dresses in, in black and, black and white. Oh, like, <laughs> um, so I, I was thinking to myself about this person, this cop. And I don't mean to generalize, I don't know if his life is like this, but I'm just imagining based on TV shows that I watch, based on my experience growing up. I'm like thinking about this police cop. And in America, like Badavka, like they're very, very angry and they have like very little patience and they're very intense. If you go to other countries, like even in Israel, it's like they just look kind of like you, except they like they say they're a cop. Whereas in America, you feel it. Like yeah, they, I am a cop. I feel like I, there's a, to get you. Yeah, there's a big power that there's a reason for that because they because they are. So so I was thinking about this person, and he's probably working, you know, long hours during the week. And 
probably in Marlboro, New Jersey, there's not a lot of action. And he's a ranger. So what, you know, what is he probably doing most of the time? Probably, yeah, donut, donut. <laughs> donut, right? Can't be, can't be, can't be like that. He can't be that emotionally satisfied, you know? He can't, so like, what is he probably doing? He's probably working. And then he probably has the weekends off. And what is he probably doing during that weekend? He's probably drinking, right? Like, I'm going to hang, hang out with my boys, watch the football games on Sunday, okay. Saturday, drink some beers, right? And that's my chill, and that's how I relax, and that's, my, and that's what I do every week. Now, in the Western world, that's totally normal. And if you ask most people who are secular what, what is like their life like, it's pretty much like five days a week I'm busting my right? kishkes. kishkes. And then on the weekend, I do the things that I want to do. And often, you know, a lot of times, that will be using some type of substance, drinking, a- engaging some type of activity, you know, whatever. Now, <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself how, how backwards everything is. That for a person who's in the forest who's singing and dancing and clapping and he has Poland spring water and he doesn't have vodka, that's bizarre. But if I had alcohol in my bottle, oh, sure. then that would be normal. It would be normal for me to feel so uh, uninhi- un- un- uninhibited now that I can actually be myself because I have uh, ingested a, a poison so that I will be able to experience a state of being in which that I am not concerned about what others think about me. And now I'm going to be myself and be happy for these few moments of the week. And then the rest of the week, I'm just trying to make money so that I can get to that point so I can have that experience, right? That's normal. But if I were to actually feel happy like that and to be myself like that during the week, each day, and to do it through natural means, that's literally insane. It's a punishable offense that you can get you arrested. It's a disturbance to everybody around. And so um, um, I was just realizing... Um, and also, yeah. not to get into politics at all, it's just a waste of time, but um, it explains exactly why every person is jumping on the bandwagon with this whole thing. It's like they're so hungry for just something. Like, oh, I hate a Jew, let's do it. Palestinians, yay. Another reason to get, get Make together. the connection. <laughs> like, it's just another version of partying on the weekends. Like, oh, a cause. Let's go hate. Ah. So they're so empty of life. This is what I, I say this to all the time. People, people who are busy having problems with other people, there's only one reason. That person's not allowing himself to be himself and therefore he's not happy. And because of that, everything bothers him. And he thinks it's, that's the problem, and that's the problem, and this is the problem, and that's the problem. And there's really only one problem. He himself is not happy, and therefore he sees only missing things and everything around him. But if you allow himself to feel happy and to be himself, he wouldn't see those lackings in those people around him. Actually, you look for lackings and see how you can help him and fill them. Right, right. Yeah. That would be right, the positive aspect of it, for sure. So in this case... Why is it that a person's able to feel happy when he's connected to a tzaddik? Because by connecting to a tzaddik, it brings the ruach of Kodesh inside of him, and it brings the ruach of Acher outside. And automatically, it's not just when I say Shema and it turns the resh into a dollar just during that one moment, but my whole day. What is it that turns Acher into Echad? That throughout the whole day, I feel happy. Throughout the whole day, I feel joyful. Throughout the whole day, I feel alive. It's through closeness to tzaddikim. Because through that, then always, I don't have a resh, I have a dalit. I'm not trying to be the king of my own life. I'm actually connected to the king of existence. I'm connected to something which is much bigger than me. That from is the four ruchot, right? Because dalit is gematria four. Kamosh katuv, komar Hashem, me'arba ruchot, boa ruach. Like Hashem said, from the four ruchot comes the ruach. So if you'll notice that in uh, the story of Sipori Masiot and the Lost Princess, right, the third giant, he gathers all the winds, 
And then there was one last win that comes at the very end. And the one last win that comes at the very end, he's the one who brings the Viceroy to the lost princess. So I was thinking as I was looking over this lesson, it reminds me of this Pasuk, that these four winds come and it brings the Ruach. Meaning that the four winds is the Malchut. It's the kingship. It's um, the Dalit. And when I have that Dalit, from there comes the Ruach. Means the coats of the Dalit. That's what brings you to the lost princess. Now, what's the coats of the Dalit? In the center, you can, go, you can go every direction. Right. Tikkuni Zohar says that coats of the Dalit, that Ruach is the Ruach of the Tzadik. That is his Lushen Trua. Lushen Tura'am B'Shevet Barza. That this concept of Ruach is the Lushen of Trua. Why? Like the Pasuk says in Tehillim, King David is speaking about overcoming his enemies. Tura'am B'Shevet Barza. He breaks them with this staff of iron. That word for break or to shatter is the same shores as trua, the sound of the shofar. Meaning, what is it supposed to be doing for you? It's supposed to be breaking a part of you. When you hear the shofar, what is it breaking? It's breaking the ruach shtut. What's the ruach shtut? The ego. That's what that sound is supposed to be doing. That is the ruach of the tzaddik. Now, if you look at this pasuk, you'll notice that King David is talking about how he overcomes his enemies. He has teroim. He breaks it. Now we're learning, what is the breaking? The breaking is through the Ruach. It's the Ruach HaKodesh that King David has, meaning it's his connection, it's his attachment to the Tzaddik, that he is able to destroy his enemies through Barzel. Now if you look at Barzel, you're going to notice it's four letters, and it's also an acronym. Bilha, Rachel, Zilpa, Leah. The four foremothers. What do they all represent? Tefillah. But Sarah's not in there? Yaakov's wives. Yaakov's Sorry, Yaakov's, Yaakov's wives. Yaakov's wives. Uh, okay. Bilha, Rachel, Zilpa, Leah. Kabbalah, they explain that Yaakov's wives represent the archetype of tefillah, perfected prayer. So in this case, what is this? Through attachment to the tzaddik, I'm able to overcome my enemies, meaning arrogance, meaning ego, through barzel, through tefillah, through amuna. Bilha, Rachel, Zilpa, Leah. What do we say from the very beginning? The whole key is that tefillah goes from being like a mountain to being like a field to being like a home. What do we say is the key to doing that? The tzaddik. For him, tefillah is like that. And when we attach ourselves to the tzaddik, then tefillah becomes like that for us. Then we don't just have basic tefillah. We have barzel. We have this tefillah that King David had. We have the tefillah of all of Yaakov's wives. We got married to all of them. And now through her, we're able to overcome all the enemies, my personal enemies, and the enemies of the Jewish people. And this is what destroys the Ruach of arrogance. Kel Acher, which is the other God, which is Kafir, atheism. And you said to get, to get the Ruach, you have to get close to Tadikim. And you're saying something about. Um, about being a battle, about, um, I don't know if you said it now, but you said before, to, to, to trust what they're saying, to do whatever they're saying. If you don't understand it, to listen, to, that's what it means to get close to the That's what it means to attach yourself to them. To attach yourself. And Meaning the Hebrew lesson of the East Carbos? Right. And when you attach yourself, then automatically the Ruach of the Tzaddik starts to become imbued within your heart. It doesn't mean like a physical, also closeness, like going to give it to Deacon. Also, also, <clears throat> also it means to do that. But, but Rabbi Nachman brings in the Kutum Ran that Itkashu to the Tzaddik in its essence is the Eitzes of the Tzaddik, I do what he says. I'm on a mission. And what's my mission? Whatever the Rebbe says to do. And by doing that, the Ruach of the Tzaddik then becomes imbued within you. So why is it that the Ruach of the Tzaddik is able to come in when you do these things, even though you don't understand them? Is it when you do them or when you just learn about them, you hear about them? Do them. 
That's, that's like the, that's yeah. really, you're really showing yeah. that I'm throwing my sechel out and I'm going to even do it. Because, because you already know them and process them enough that we're going to show them You do them. Why, why is it that doing it causes that? Because doing it means humility. You're not trying to understand it or use your own because or anything. Because if I'm ever going to do something that I don't understand or I don't resonate with doing right now or I don't want to do right now and I do it anyway, that is an expression of humility. And the opposite is obviously arrogance. Right. I only do it if I understand it. Right. Or only if I want to. Right? So in this, in this case, we're trying to let the Ruach of the Tzaddik enter into us. Why? Because that Ruach of the Tzaddik pushes aside mm-hmm. and, and, and um, expels arrogance. That arrogance is actually what gets in the way of you being happy. So a person might say to himself, I won't be happy if I do these eights of the Tzaddik. I won't be happy if I do an Arabi Bodo do. I won't be happy if I get up for Chatzot. I won't be happy if I do. I won't be happy if I do these things. The truth is, you're not happy because you only live for yourself. That's so what. Even when you go to the Eitzah, you think, "Was it? What is it in it for me? How it's going to affect me?" Right. Stop doing that. But you don't realize that actually the joy will come from I'm doing this despite the fact that I don't understand or I don't want to. Why? Because I'm breaking the koach of ego. I'm breaking the koach of an external self. And I'm allowing the ruach of the tzaddik to enter into me. That's how I, it's by doing these eitzes that I now give the tzaddik like a channel, a tzinor, with he can pump ruach into me. He can't do it until I uh, attach like that. That's the whole inyan of Yoshu ben Nun. How did he get the ruach of Moshe? He never left his tent. What does it mean that he never left his tent? He was the first chassid. Whatever Moshe said, he did. That was it. And, that, and, and it was through that that he was able to makasher himself to Moshe. And that's how he got the Ruach in him to the extent that he could then overcome Amalek. Because what's the whole in- Indian of Yeshua? He's Mashiach ben Yosef. Right? That's the whole Indian of him. And what is that point of Mashiach ben Yosef? So Chazal explained that the whole Indian of the children of Yosef or Mashiach ben Yosef is to destroy Amalek, to overcome Amalek. Right? How does he do that? He's doing it through that Ruach. It's that Ruach that allows him to overcome Amalek. Okay? Where does the Ruach come from? His Hidkashra to Moshe. But you have to be able to do something to let the Ruach of Moshe into you. What is the mechanism that can, I can do to allow the Ruach of Moshe into me? Either I can go through really, really difficult things and they make me realize that I don't know what I'm doing and now I can hear from Moshe or it's by doing his Eitzes even when I don't resonate or I don't understand them, and I do them anyway, that itself allows uh, that pocket of Ruach to enter into me without even having to go through the difficulties. I don't need them to humble me because I'm humbling myself. Mm-hmm. So that's through getting close to Tzadikim. That's called being close to Tzadikim. And, that, and, and, right. But you said Moshe was got his ruach from seeing every Mo, Mo, as greater than him. Mo, because he was a tzaddik. Can, but Moshe, Moshe is ruach. So instead of like thinking about it, Moshe is like a different... It's not like a mama myself. He is the tzaddik. No, he, he is ruach. Like, I, I think I told you guys this in the past, that uh, the Arizal brings down all the Gilgulim of Moshe Rabbeinu, all of the reincarnations of Moshe. And how he's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. back all the way to the times of before the Ma'bul when Noach. He's he first his first human incarnation uh, is as uh, Hevel, Adam Rishon's son, and then after Hevel is killed, he comes back when Shait is born, which was the third son. He comes back as Shait, and then he comes as Noach. And he goes to all the incarnations, Moshe, all the way down until the results. Okay. But the most fascinating part of all of it, and the whole thing is fascinating, is that he explains, like, why is Moshe the fourth sphere of Netzach? Netzach means it's always there. That's the property of Netzach. It, it exists always. There can't be a time that, net, that it's not there, otherwise it's not Netzach. Right? It's not eternal then. So what about before Hevel? Uh-huh. The Ruach in the Gan. It was the Ruach in the Gan. The Ruach in the Gan. Yeah. That escaped from Adam before. Me myself. 
the Ruach in the Gan that blew. It wasn't created with Adam. It wasn't. <laughs> no, the Ruach in the Gan is Moshe. So the first. So it was created before man. Yes. <clears throat> Not even on the sixth day. Ruach I mean, Elohim. There's that midrash that uh, anyway, the name of Mashiach was made uh, Beinish Mashiach or whatever. So. Ruach Elohim Marchev. Mashiach was made. Oh, Ruach Elo. Ruach Elohim Marchev Bet Al Pnei Amayim. That the Ruach of Hashem oh, oh, is hovering over the world. That's oh, even before existed. So who oh. is that? What is that Ruach Elohim? <laughs> it's Moshe. He is the Ruach. So when when Rabbi Nachman, when they asked him thousands of years later, mm-hmm. when people come to me and say to me. What, what, what are you doing with breast lovers? And what are you doing with this crazy Rebbe Nachman? And why are you going to breast lovers? And why are you traveling for this? And why are you changing your life for this? And they said, well, how can I explain it to them? So Rebbe Nachman said, when they ask you what you found in breast love, tell them, Ruach. So Pshat is, meaning I found joy now. I'm like, I'm happy now. You also go to Karlovach and get some Ruach. Yeah. I, found, I found life. Meaning I was like, I felt like I was dead before and now I feel like alive. Sure. That's Pshat and like that's enough for all of us. But Reb, everything Rabbi Nachman says is true on many, many, many levels. And on one of the higher levels of this truth is he's saying that I'm that Ruach. I'm Moshe. You understand? So. <clears throat> yeah, you found me. You found Ruach. You found Ruach. You found me. Yeah. You found that thing. You found the Ruach Elohim Archef at Apanei that's what you found in Brussels. Tell them that's what you found. <laughs> okay? Now, but you can't, you like, you need to have a keili for the Ruach to come in. Why is it that certain people connect to the Rebbe and certain people, they can't? Because some people are humble and some people are not. Why is it that many breast lovers only get to the Rebbe when they go through difficulties or challenges in their life. So people are going to say, oh, because Rebbe Nachman attracts the crazies. That's not what it is at all. It's just that when a person go through, goes through difficulties in their life, it makes them very, very humble. And as soon as they become humble, they're able to experience the or the tzaddik. They're able to receive ruach. In a practical sense, that doesn't mean that that they, when you are humble, that you look at yourself necessarily as lower than everyone, every other yid. That's a, an absurd concept. They think that you're inherently worth less because because you're Mo- Moshe's Moshe's level was very very high. It's not the type that we're thinking about when we're talking about um, if I think I'm less than other people, less in the sense that now. I, I, um, my value is less. When, you're, when your self-esteem is high enough, it's so high that it's not related at all to my own self. I'm, relieving, I'm receiving all my esteem from Hashem. My belief in Hashem is what's causing my belief, my trust. Then automatically, I see the good in others. And I don't project my own lackings onto them. I assume that they actually have good and they meant well with what they did and I can always improve. And that's Moshe's whole madrega, is he's constantly moving from place to, like the Baal Shem Tov, right? Well, maybe Hashem wants me to learn from this person. Oh, can I learn right. from them? The Baal Shem, what, what made, one of the things that made the Baal Shem Tov so unique was that he literally... You know, the Chazal say you should learn from everybody. Who's a wise person? A person who learns from everybody. But the Baal Shem Tov was a chassid. So what does that mean for him? It doesn't mean you should learn from everybody, meaning like... But that's the people that you have a problem with. Me, no, but the, the, he took it very, very literally, because it was to me, some shittas. He literally took that as, I can learn from everybody. If I, if I meet a, 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 a deaf mute, I can learn from him the myla of being deaf and mute. And how I can serve God with that. If I meet a person who, like, there was a woman who came and started throwing rocks at the Baal Shem Tov. You shagats, you crazy, uh, uh, false Mashiach, and you're des- destroying Judaism. And Mama goes to throw a rock at her. And then, like, as soon as she tries to throw it, she can't. And then, whatever. 
And the Baal Shem Tov starts to go, Hashem, when can I ever reach the level of this woman? That she's so committed to her truth that she's literally willing to kill me for it. <laughs> he learned from her. He did this with everyone. Children, animals, grass. He was always literally looking with everything. How can I get closer to Hashem through this thing? Like, uh, he, would con <laughs> yeah, he, would, he would constantly, like when he would travel through the world, he would, Davka would have conversations with like these higher uh, existences to find out who ha who's the epitome of Simcha. I want to see in this generation, what's like the highest, who's holding on to the highest Madriga Simcha? Who's holding on to the highest Madriga of Anava? Who's holding on to the highest Madriga of Tefillah? And then you have those amazing Hasidic stories where like, it's never like the Talmud Chacham. It's always like the kid who doesn't know Hebrew or it's the shepherd who's like totally alone. And like, uh, yeah, like the, I was, I was uh, learning this, this story uh, with my kids and the Balsam Tov wanted to see who's serving Hashem to the greatest degree in our generation. And he's brought to like this person, he was a shepherd and he was outside with his animals and he, and he saw him and he was saying to Hashem, I have nothing to offer you. I don't know any Torah and I don't know how to pray and I don't know the Hebrew alphabet, I don't know nothing. I can't do anything for you. It's only one thing I know. Bah. I literally, the only thing I know is how my sheep sound when they start to, I'm gonna give you that. And he starts, bah, bah. <laughs> but like with all of his heart. <laughs> and then after he does this, he starts to get so excited from the fact that like, he's genuinely hitting a point of truth within himself, that this is what he can offer. And bah to Hashem, that's my praise to you. That's all I can do. And then after that, he starts to like, oh gosh, I got, I got nothing for you, Hashem. There's nothing I can do, nothing I can do. I don't know anything. Oink, 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 oink. Like, that I have for you. And he starts to go and he's like, whatever, oh, he keeps doing this. And the Baal Shem Tov <sighs> realizes here again, how much Hashem appreciates truth. How much he appreciates tamimut, simplicity and innocence. Like this is what it means to serve Hashem at the highest of levels, right? But how was the Baal Shem Tov able to get to the point that he wanted to learn from everybody? Humility. That's the only way you can learn from people is if you feel like you have what to learn from them. But if the Baal Shem Tov is the Tzadik Yisod Olam, he's the light of ancient days, he's the light of the seven days of creation, what does he have to learn from the deaf mute? What is that light? That light of ancient days is the light of Anava, humility. You can learn from everything and everyone. That, that ore that he's holding onto is the so ore of Moshe, it's the Ruach. We should try to do that. I mean, you know, sort of, Reb Nachman, sorry, Reb Nachman, Reb Nachman, did he do? Yes. And we don't, we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about him. He's so, he's so hidden. Yes. But while he was teaching and while he was giving it over, it, was, it didn't look like he was, he was there to give. He wasn't there to receive at that point. He didn't seem like it at least. He didn't seem like he was there to like. It wasn't like a Baal Shem to a figure of saying, "How can I learn from this person?" It looked like at that point he was like so mevutal, but I'm here to give. I'm here to give you guys what you need. I'm not here to sit and try to learn from the from the beggar boy. Yeah. Right. And that's why Rabbi Nachman said, I'm not, you're not supposed to be like me. You're supposed to listen to what I teach you. Not come to my for, for the Baal that, that was what he needed to do. And for Rabbi Nachman, he was, he couldn't, that wasn't what he needed to do. That was, that was what the Baal Shemtov needed to do. And that was the and highest teacher, level teacher at that point. Good. And the Rabbi Nachman said, I'm bringing down a higher level, right. <laughs> but but Rabbi Nachman said constantly, the things that you see me do, they're not for you to do. He goes, I'm a mystery. Nobody understands me at all. Uh, just 
don't even try and <laughs> figure out what's going on with me. Wow. He, like there's so many types of where you had conversations with people where you would go out to the woods with another tzaddik, like a very famous tzaddik of the generation, and they're discussing what was the tafkid of this tzaddik? What did he bring to the world? And going over each of them, over each of them, over each of them. And then Rabbi Nachman said, my tafkid is a total mystery. And nobody will ever understand it, and nobody's ever going to figure it out. You're never going to know what it is, and even if I told you what it is, it would still be a mystery. He's just a mystery. He's Pele. He's just like, not, not for us to do. Okay? For us to do is what he taught. Whatever he taught, that's what we should do. In terms of Kamei Mamash. You should be trying to learn from everybody. Doesn't mean you have to become uh, neurotic about it, you have to become anxious about it. It just means when I'm in a situation where something negative seemingly happens, what's the chokhmah in that thing? What's the thing that I could take from that thing? But when I'm in a mission and I walk out to the street or whatever, I walk into my home or whatever, and I remind myself to sort of connect back to my center and say, okay, oh, yeah, that's right, mission. That's all right. You know, oh, you got to be on a mission. They don't know. Like, oh, like, oh, nothing's in front of me. Right, right you're on a right. mission. But then once that's over and I go back to my hipoda dude, you have all the emotions that were taking place during that time. Then you have to let it out. That time that you let it out, that's when you do the soul searching. And that's when you're trying to figure out what could I learn from that experience? How could I become better? How can I become more humble? How can I become more... More uh, clean. Right. But... Except those eights one. Right. Be more mekura for the tzaddik. Look for the tzaddik again. Right. But the point is like this. Rabbi Nachman's trying to give you a way to achieve this plea of humility, not by having to go through things. Doesn't mean you're going to not have to go through it. Everybody has to go through things. But there's a very, very easy mechanism, which is a very difficult mechanism, but it's a very simple mechanism. Take the eights that I tell you and do them. If you take the eights that I say and you do them, you, be, you become humble. And the, and the more that you do them, the more humble you become, and the more my ruach can then penetrate you and enter into you more. And it doesn't really matter how it works. We're not going to get it anyway. So just do it. Right. There's a lot of levels to what's happening and why it works and what it's affecting. And, and, and you're going to see the beauty and the benefits of it. But automatically, when I'm a Kaim and Eitzah, whether or not I understand it, or even whether or not right now I really want to do it, automatically I know I'm doing one thing. I'm humbling myself. And as long as I'm humbling myself, I'm allowing the Ruach of the Tzadik to enter into me, and I'm switching the Reish to a Dalet. I'm switching Acher to Echad. And, and paradoxically, this thing that I feel like is going to make me not happy because I don't want to do it, it's actually going to bring me to joy. Because joy is a product of humility. Joy comes from humility. Okay? Joy comes from Anava. When I was in the H Kodesh in the, and I heard this very well-meaning young uh, Talmud there, you know, steiging in the Gemara, and then having a conversation with the one person there who, like, grew up secular, and then he became Balchuva, and he did it, like, the yeshivish route, and it, like, it, like he told me, he goes, it was really good for my brain, it was really bad for my heart. <laughs> And then uh, I became a chassid. And, um, and so his, his name is Rabbi Smiles. That's a good name for a chassid. Yeah. You know? He's, yeah, I mean, he's like Pia Tesla. Like, yeah. Spike. Yeah. So this, this, this student asked Rabbi Smiles, he said to him, can I ask you a real question? He said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm not saying it in a disrespectful way. I really want to know because I'm, I'm just thinking about it. You know, this person grew, probably grew up secular, this student, now he's a Baltruva, and he's learning Torah, and he's learning the Gemara. He's like, he said, do tzaddikim have fun? And he meant it. He didn't mean it in disrespect. Like, and Rabbi Smile said back to him, the most fun. <laughs> do they have fun? They have the most fun. That was them this exam when I was sitting here last week. It's like this is really good. I'm like, Kept you at Sadiq. Yeah, like I kept like it's, it's fun to be at Sadiq. Like, yeah. Get into it. Mm -hmm. If you look at every Pasuk and Tilim, all King David keeps saying is how happy Tzadikim are. 
we think it means like he's trying to do the whole the whole thing is like right we think it's just like king david's trying to say come tzaddikim let's sing together no he's saying tzaddikim are the ones who are singing they're the ones who are really happy. They're the ones who are having a lot of fun. You got to put in the work. I mean, can't, yeah. it's not free. No, that's how you become a tzaddik. You have to toil. But the I'm work sa- isn't what we think it is. No, the work is not what you think it is. It's not slapping of your shots. <laughs> 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 that's it, man. <laughs> it's, 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 it's mavatoing myself to a tzaddik. It's, it's ikashu to a tzaddik, okay? And when I do this, I'm humbling myself. And the more humble I become, the more of a tzaddik I'm becoming. That is what a tzaddik is. It's, it's humility. Rabbi Nachman says clearly in the fourth Torah, look at Tehran, that the tzaddik emet is the bechina of Moshe, is the bechina of Anav Ma'od. He reaches the highest level of humility. That's how he becomes Moshe. So the more humble I become, the more of a tzaddik I'm becoming. Me being a tzaddik has nothing to do with how much Torah I'm learning, even though that helps you to do it. It has nothing to do with, with anything except to do with my humility. But what brings me to the humility, it comes from learning, it comes from climbing the mitzvahs, it comes from Mikash to the tzaddikim, it comes from, uh, you know, all these different things. From being on a mission. Right, from being on a mission. But it's ultimately, the, like, how, what's my gauge or how, my tzidkis? It's my humility. That's all it is. Meaning, I'm, I'm we're normal mothers right now, today, I value my time, I... I'm on a mission, so I say, okay, I have to use my time to try to learn as much as I can. Okay. Not because I'm uh, going to be a big Tommy Chachm or anything, right. just because I should give me this time. You remind me of that song that you sent me now? Which one? Oh, yeah, 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 you know, much higher, higher, you know, higher drug or whatever it is, and he's not learning at all. Right. But I do have my time. I know I see my hours in front of me because I, I can either choose to sit in front of in the office all day or minimize that time and try to learn as much as I can. Because I have to just use my time with Seth and decide how to use that time. I mean, not right. because I'm trying to be a big Tamil Chacham. No. If you're trying to learn in order that you should be a Tamil Chacham, that means you're not learning the Shem Shemayim. And Rabbi Nachman says in the third Torah of the Qutumran, it's learning L'Shem Shemayim that brings you to humility. Which means, why am I lear- what is L'Shem Shemayim? I'm learning to get close with Hashem. And if that means... That, and if that means I'm if gonna, that means I need to learn a lot, or I need to learn for 15 hours a day, let's just say for that person. It means that in whatever time period I'm in in the day, and whatever that means, and whatever the Rebbe tells me that that's what's going to bring me close with Hashem, do it. Then, then I do it, and that's called I'm doing it. Thing. Right, and everybody at his own level, and everybody's own uh, in his own takuf in his life, wherever he's at, and what he, what he's capable of, whatever. But it's based on. So if the Rebbe says, "I have this whole learning seder for you," if you're capable of doing it, so you're doing it. You're not doing that learning seder so you can become a talmud chacham. Now, if you actually did it every day, you will probably become a talmud chacham. But that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because the Rebbe says so. No, that's called the Shema? That, yeah. The Rebbe says so. Because the Rebbe says so. Like when people the say... The time that Tani says about doing it all so that when you go upstairs, you know, when you go upstairs uh, before Shema, you know. Also, good, Rebbe Nachman never talks about that. You, you're doing it, everything, Rebbe Nachman's whole language, which is very unique, and you don't find it actually literally anywhere, now they use it more often because Bali Chuva really, really connect to it. That this idea of Karev La Hashem, drawing closer to Hashem. You see Rabbi Nachman speaking about this like in every lesson. That I'm doing this and it brings you closer to Hashem. Or you feel far from Hashem. And you need to get closer to Hashem. Right? The this, language didn't exist in... You don't see it anywhere. Show me where you find it. I don't know. It's not... I'm a, just guessing. Why? 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 Nope. Every disease nope. has, has their own like unique Lashem. Yeah. Really, you know, doesn't... I'm, like right now, I'm in a, a different like club where I just joined recently. They go through like all of the svarim. Okay, good. Not particularly, not just like Hasidus also, but also Nusser and okay. also Sephardi and Kabbalah and right. And everyone has their own lashon. But like, yeah. someone tells me like you have to connect your nashon of nefesh of Hamis and like, what does that mean? Like, give me what is Rabbeinu? What is Rabbeinu used for that? And it took me like a long time. But if we said Pash this, in Rabbeinu's lashon, it would be, for example, like Belayt. Or or it would be, or or 
he was getting a spiritual exercise of like connecting with your Natsah Khoid meaning saying like I feel that Rabbeinu doesn't say that Rabbeinu just says what to do he doesn't have all these ca- like categories and right stuff he it's doesn't necessary. I'm just saying that someone if someone <laughs> doesn't okay, say it's not you know what it means no, 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 says what to do and that's it okay know? when I say you should make yeah. the Nefesh of Bahamas feel good what does that mean to you I'm an open lucrative writer exactly <laughs> that's what I mean for me it's like I don't know I already have Nefesh of Bahamas and like that's what I'm saying you just gotta keep it simple bro you know? <laughs> I'm just saying that the judges you can get tripped up there's a picture of him no Kabbalah to understand Rebbeinu he brings everything Rebbeinu brings Kabbalah all the time he brings it when you need it he brings it when you need it there's a big picture of him just in place the cows are here whatever they call it anyway the, the, the point is like this. Yes, they're all trying to get you to the, to the same thing, essentially. Rabbi Nachman's language is to get drawn closer to Hashem. Everything he's talking about is about drawing closer to Hashem. Why? Why does he use that language? Because that's humility. That's me being on a mission. That, 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 that's a deeper purpose. Why am I doing it? To draw closer to Hashem? Because that's what Hashem wants. Hashem wants me to be close to Him. All right. You kind of think that Rabbi Nachman's the best. There's nothing better. <laughs> And I kind of don't have any mind, like bandwidth for almost anything else other than all the just the basics. So what I mean, so 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 you know, what did I got to do? I feel like most wrestlers have that as part of, part of why I joined this kabura because I wanted a bigger perspective. Rabina says you shouldn't like throw away the other's farm. You should learn everything. You and he has a, in near the end of Chaimur, and has a lot of respect for a lot of uh, the polnoyer and like, right. the, you know a lot of different because like, wait, 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 wait. but he said. You shouldn't see like it goes uh, by Torah hey about seeing the the you, you'll see if you see a, a, a chiluk between the tzaddikim then you're like then you're still stuck with uh, chachma achitzayon. That's if you see the but, between them. But I know that you know that I, like you know say I, I went through parts of Swasemes or Tanya or whatever it is and like it just it's great I'm sure it's the highest of the highest I just nothing happens. Right. Tachas. This week, the leave it doesn't give you. The it doesn't, it doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem to you give me. It doesn't form. give me this. I'm sure it can. And no, what it says it says is that there. Of course, there's a deacon. You know, just because Rabbeinu has a different outlook that that where uh, let's say we're late Yitzchak, someone that's confirmed tzaddik. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to start taking sides. But the Balatani he had respect for, right? Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. So like, tell me they don't take me, sides, but tell, you don't have tell me to like, be a X Y or Z. You don't have to leave. Breslev in order to respect them. Ooh, he's saying you're leaving Breslev like I'm learning these lessons. <laughs> 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 I, I, I like it, I like it. You get that. No, like, no he's he's a, punch. You can't see, you can't see a Chilu game between them, but, but we got the other. He doesn't say you can't see a Chilu. Uh, it's just how are you supposed to learn from other people? That's the that's the lemaisa. How if you have Rabbeinu, like, aren't you kind of like going to a lower darga? Like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Wasting my time going to like a let's say Rabbeinu, a lower darga to. The, the, First of all, you need to know, you need to know how much time you have, and you need to know what what your capacity is in that time, and and this, you and this is all I got. And, I, got and, I got enough and, time and, to do this a lot. And you and you need to know where I'm holding spiritually, and you need to know did I grow up religious to a family of Rabbanim and I was taught all of the different sources from a very young age and I had <coughs> kind of this place within my brain that it can all exist or have I not even yet figured out what Rabbi Nachman wants from me right so what I usually tell people because I, I see what what happens is when people start to get really involved with Rabbi Nachman's teachings they they really feel excited but they start to feel like I feel like I'm doing something wrong though. Like I'm, I'm by not, I'm not I'm learning. Uh, I, I, I feel like everyone else is doing something wrong. Yeah. Right, 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 right. But I'm saying that I'm not that. I'm, I'm, I'm like people. Are, people keep telling me, but now you're like getting very narrow focused, and you're like, there's a whole tour, and there's a whole uh, this, and you're missing out on all these different things, and that's all. It's. It's theoretically true, but ultimately, how old are you? How much time you have left in your life? How much time you have in your day? And do you, like, the, the way that I usually uh, encourage people, I encourage people to first, um, Rabbi Nachman's teachings are like an ocean, okay? If you are, like, trying to, like, dabble in the ocean, you, 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 don't, you don't learn how to surf in it. And 
if and, and I see what happens with a lot of people is they dabble in a lot of types of Hasidus, but they don't know how, to know how to surf in any of them. And I personally think it's a yay to hard clothes in a mitzvah. And I'm not saying just go for breastlift. I'm saying whatever you choose, surf, surf in it. Like, immerse yourself. immerse yourself in it for a period of time in your life. And when you get to the point that I really feel like this is, this is such a part of my being that I feel like I'm living with this in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm surfing, then start to look at all the other things and it's beautiful. But if you, I, my experience has been myself and my experience has been with every single person that I know, literally without a, a, anybody tshuva that I know, that, you know, you don't realize that it's, 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 it's much, it's very easy to dabble. Because dabbling means I don't have to invest in anything. And if I don't have to invest, it means I never have to push myself beyond my limits. Dabbling feels like, sorry for the lack of clean words, but like a sort of a shmirda brit issue. And that I'm just kind of like mefazer, my kohot, on this, a little bit of this tour, and 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 it's like, I got nothing. I'm like, I literally have ethics. It's like when it's like when I completely shut out the world, it's like all I got is the Kudim Yom. Just let me be a little closer to it that when I feel like I can just jump from Torah to Torah, I'm like, oh, eat, oh, let me take another eight step from the Rebbe, another eight step from the Rebbe. And then I, like, I know that, like, I know around the corner that that's where right. I want to go and that's what so, I want. Right. So, what, once right. you feel secure enough and sound enough, foundation, like, you have your foundation in Breslau, learn everything. But do you feel like that? You're doing an hour of Ipoh to do it every day, you're getting up for Atzot every morning, you're praying. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not even thinking about that. Oh, but I guess in the, you, you're, you're like, you feel totally confident and comfortable, like you really, you, you hone the whole thing, you're surfing with it. <laughs> okay, so th learning those things doesn't bring you closer to surfing with Rebbe Nachman's teachings. Right. But that's not to say that those things don't have unbelievable value. It's just, you have to just take stock of my life. How old am I? How no, far behind? I'm only looking at those things for an hour a week. It's not like, you know, the rest of it's all good. Else. It's all it's good. Like, Rabbi Nachman said to learn everything. And, and a lot Go of that is liquid and a lot of that is Rabbi Nachman. But you can't, without it, you right. can't. <laughs> my, my experience has been, personally, and my experience has been with people who do this, is that me personally, I would go learn that thing and it's like, oh, that's interesting. But it just reminds me of Rabbeinu said this and this and this and this. But, <laughs> but, exactly. But, that, but, that's, that's, but, but that's it. And like and it doesn't hold on. It doesn't like hold on any like real. Tool. Yeah, I don't. I don't. There's no. There's no nafkamina. Right. There's no. There's no. There's no. There's no. There's no pra like, I, there was a chassid, the breast of a chassid who came to me. He said, like, I got to a point like after I started doing tshuva, where like I couldn't take, like learning things that made no practical difference in my life anymore. Like in the beginning, I was just like, you know, oh, that's an inspirational idea. Oh, that's a nice idea. Like. I'm like, I'm so, I'm so burnt out and I'm so tired and like, I don't care anymore. Well, like those sheets of like before the part of like 50 different kinds of like, you know, like you have like little mini like article on each one. Like I used to kind of get excited about each one and I'm like, what? I don't. Yeah. Like, it, will, it will do nothing for me. I'll it said, five it said, later. It said if, it's, if, it's not, if it's not practically uh, applicable in my life and it's not affecting my life, I, I don't, wanna, I don't right. care. Right. And nobody aff practically affects my life more than Rebbe Nachman. That's what, that's, 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 <laughs> okay, so, so he's saying for him in, in his takufa right now, he wants to swim in it. And, and this is how I encourage people. And this has been my experience for me. S swim. Swim. First, you have, to, you have to learn how to swim. Be not because you have to, because it's dogma, and if you don't, nothing like that. It's all good. But you just don't want to, you're not going to know how to swim. Why? And, you'll, and you'll never feel that ruach. And you'll never feel the ruach. And, and you'll always wonder to yourself, like, why, why, did I why, why do I feel like I never got to that place? And the answer is because I, I never fully immersed myself in the ocean long enough to learn how to swim. And then once you get there, then when you look at all the other things, you see unbelievable beauty in even just like a most basic Rashi, Mishnah. There's, there's Mishnah, like, there's Rashi. There's kinds of swimming. There's swimming, there's like, like Noam was saying more of like diving. He was saying like, pick, pick a Torah and like. Oh, and I wasn't saying that. I, I'm just I, saying I, I, don't, I don't go very deep. I just learn a lot. Like, 
They, you know, uh, when I say the swimming, muscle, when I say swim across no, the ocean, the muscle, the muscle on a surface no, level, no, I'm, you're missing. We're going for doing. No, I'm, yeah, I'm, you're right. missing. You're missing the muscle that I'm saying. I'm not saying swimming on the Torah. I mean that the Torah is become the, Rabbi Nachman's uh, Torah has become my das to such an extent that my reference point for every part of my day <laughs> is that is that. So now, right. like, what do I do now? So what and, I, I, and, and I'm responding based on this das. What am I doing now? This das. Oh, I'm feeling really good. Oh, now that means I have to push more. Oh, I'm feeling really bad. Now I have to hold on. That, that literally, like, I, I'm... My I had a bad feeling of that Torah about, the, you know, the, doing the next feel will come. And right. so that's, that's what I meant when I said having a strong foundation. Or just living with that das. That's I, don't mean, but, I don't mean the Misa doing everything because... Who is? You know? Right. That's coming in Mamash. You said we should, I mean. Right. But, right. But that, but that's what I mean by swimming. When you're swimming in it like that, then yes. But if you, but if you're swimming in it like that and you find that you're, that that swimming is also, you, hasn't gotten you to the point yet that you're actually also makayiming mm -hmm. the eights. So you're still swimming. You're not, you're not swimming yet. You're, still you're not swimming yet. You're not swimming yet. You're not swimming yet. No, you're not swimming yet. <laughs> It could, you see it, Rav Natan, a million times over. It has to end in Misa. And it's fine if you're not there yet. That's totally fine. But if you're not there yet, you're not really swimming yet. So you, got, you have to just, that means that you just have to mm. keep going. And it could be that, you know, me looking at other things, which is totally fine. So Misa, you're saying them. And, and still consider the Torah, and there's nothing wrong with it. Not just there's nothing wrong with it. It's amazing. It's beautiful. But you still are not swimming yet. You got to swim. If you're not going to swim, you're not going to be happy. And Shem wants you to be happy, and you want to be happy. You got to be happy. And it's in, in terms of having a Nava, and is connected to Tzadik more than learning from anyone else. As in, you should learn from everyone else, but you should more than that learn from the Tzadik. Yes. Not in the... You know, opposite. Oh, I, Meaning, if someone else tells you something that goes against what the Tzaddik says, even though you can, you're supposed to learn from him. You're not supposed to learn that. No, I th when, 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 when I say learn like, from like, everybody, I don't mean learn, take, absorb every single thing that everybody says to you and oh, say it's all true, it's all real. Learn from them. Find the Tzaddik's wisdom. Find the Nakuda Tova. <laughs> Find find <laughs> find 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 the Tova in what they're doing. Just find the Nakuda Tova in it, or find how you can apply Rabbi Nachman's teaching in that place. Like for instance, let's say uh, you get very mad at your wife. So Rabbi Nachman says anger is great. You know why? Because you can turn it into rachamim. And he says that anybody who's able to turn anger into rachamim, it's mamish the ruach Mashiach is in that person. He's bringing the guru. Okay, so I have an amazing opportunity right now. Like. As opposed to before, I'm thinking to myself, this is worst case scenario, I'm a loser, I never grew out of this, I'm still getting angry and I don't know why. It's like, no, I, that, that tour pops into my head and I have an opportunity now. Everything is an opportunity. When you go through all the Kutum Iran, you go through all the Sichot Iran, you go through Chayim Iran, and you go through these things, you're going to realize that whether you're doing good or you're not doing good, you're Mekayiming or you're struggling. All of it's talked about, and the response is all in there. How do you, what do you do with this, and what do you do with that, and how do you do with this? And when you see... <laughs> that, right. When you see that my response to each of those things was based on a sikha, or on a Torah, or on a, 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 an anecdote from a Rabbi Nahum's biography, you see it's like that, that's swimming. That's swimming. But it can't be that, that you're doing that and you're also, you're not doing Hibota Dut and you're not trying to get a Farad Sot and you're not trying to get up. It doesn't mean you're succeeding in it. So but, you, you, but if you're not, if you're not you, can't, you can't say I'm swimming and, and, and I'm, not, I haven't, I'm not actually doing Lamaisa what the Rebbe says to do. So I want to ask, does life, you know, you know basically just become more Lamaisa as part of being married, or is it separate from that? Your wife, as a bacher, as whatever. Your wife, There's your wife, um, skyrockets you to the Misa. To the Misa. Yeah. So yeah. even if you, so, 
So they e have to, e so yes. Either, <laughs> either, either through the encouraging you, and now you're like, well, I can't let her down. Or crushing your or spirits until you're no longer... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or by, like, really breaking you, you down until you you have you you realize like i have to be i have to do with the time that i have so is it possible as a bachar to do rabbeinu lemaisa to swim rabbeinu said that you should get married <laughs> so basically it's, that's what it comes down to with all the do the best you can right now do the best you can right now. Well, what happens once we get married? Like, what's the Nakuda? I'm... The kind of shit, huh? I'm... The, 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 the special Nakuda of, of, the, of the wife is she makes you Lemaisa. And I'm not Lemaisa? You might be Lemaisa, but she's going to make you more Lemaisa. Oh, sweet. So, that's, I mean... But it, so it is possible. You do just do what every day do the best that you can. Sweet like caramelized onions, <laughs> not I'm sweet saying, like sugar. When I mean the maisa, I mean consistency. Consistency, or, consistency in either I'm trying to do the eitzah or I'm doing the eitzah. It's one of the two. But no, but like, if I'm no the, struggling of like no like falling off like you still fall off. I mean, you could fall off, but I'm trying. But I have to be trying. I'm either trying to or I'm doing it. But, How does Rabbeinu refer to what is what does Rabbeinu mean when he says a Yerida? Your life is ups and downs, right? right. Whether you're married or not. So right. what does that mean in Rabbeinu's? A Yerida means my mochin is the katnut. My thought process is constricted. My emotions are turbulent, but I'm holding on to the place that I'm in and I'm not allowing myself to fall. It's called what do you want to call that? So that's that's, 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 that, that's how Rabbi Nachman says Bucky in the Yerida. That's how you. That's how you that, Bucky in it. No, that's that. He says that that's how you do tshuva. You can't. You can't. You cannot. That's what the Yerida is meant to do. How do I get to experience the Yerida where the Yerida itself is actually and not a detrimental but a place of growth? Yeah, it's it. The Yerida is not getting in the way of the Aliyah. You have to do these two things constantly. You have to go back and forth. You have to be able to run to Hashem, and you have to be able to return. You have to be able to ascend, and you have to be able to descend. You have to become Bucky in both. So everything that Rabbi Nachman is helping you to do is either to push yourself constantly to grow beyond the place that you're in, or if Hashem is bringing you to a place of a Yerida, Yerida doesn't mean... You read it does mean initially that I fall back into all my bad habits and I fall back into all, all, like falling apart and to, 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 to laying in my bed for three days. And that's, that's what the Yerida is naturally. Rabbi Nachman's Koach, if you s just swim, you learn how to swim in it, is you can actually go down in a way which probably people would say sounds like an aliyah for them. Which means it's I'm not destructive. It's, uh, it's not destructive. I'm literally holding on, which is is the same thing. It's this even higher in some senses than being able to run. Okay, so what does that mean in a in an actual practical sense? Yeah, it sounds pretty. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's but it was still theoretical though. I mean, either I'm feeling excited to go do hippo to do because I'm on fire. Or I have no interest in getting up out of bed and I'm forcing myself to go do Ibarad. That's holding on to my Ibarad. Because either I'm running to it and I want to grow in my Ibarad, or I barely have words to say because I'm in so much pain and I'm so hurt and I'm so angry and I'm so confused and I go there kicking and screaming and crying. That's called holding on. That's what he was telling Rav Natan. Rav Natan's experience was all of our experiences. He would walk up a ladder and you feel like, okay, something happened, then boom, you get knocked down and you fall off the ladder completely. And then he would go up and like it would take him weeks or days or months and he would start climbing again. This time he got higher and he got hurt even more the next time. And I mean, even again. the days of when he was writing down the Kutumah with him, he, no. he said, oh, because I, we barely, like, he felt bad. He's like, I barely, I barely learned today. He goes, let's go, let's go over our day. We wrote a bit, we learned a bit, we, you know, we, we, we did two long. Like he went over, it's like, oh, just a few little things. Right. And he goes, how big is that? Right. So meaning, so one, one, day, one, one, one second, one second. So, so Rabbi Nachman, what was his 
whole revelation to Rav Natan. How do you do this successfully? How do I do this where I don't keep falling into demise? And how do I keep growing where it's, um, sub- it's, it's a, a sustainable growth? Sustainable growth. Is it always going to be me going up and then her- getting hurt to the extent that I'm dysfunctional? That's before Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman has a path where you can get to the point where you can have those same highs, but the high is bringing you from the point of your low. Meaning, I'm going up, going up, climbing as high as I can, I get knocked down. But knocked down doesn't mean off the ladder. I just, it's like wind coming down, like, a, like I'm going, 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 there's no resistance, and then all of a sudden, there's big resistance, and I can't actually climb right now. So Rabbi Nachman says, hold on. So what if you're not holding on? You're not swimming yet. Then keep doing more. Learn more. You're not swimming yet, which is fine. But what what would it mean to be? It means that I'm not I'm not flying in my hibodu, but I'm holding on to hibodu. I'm not flying in my learning where I'm excited. I'm holding on to my learning now. That's called Bucky Bishov. And that way, when you have your next high, you're not coming all the way back from the bottom again. You're doing it from this place of holding on to your level that you're on at the most least lifely level. <laughs> and that's how you have sustainable growth. And that's how he changed Rav Natan's life. And that's what he has for all of us available for all of us. It's the most, it's the most brilliant, it's the most unbelievable, it's the most real, it's the most genuine. It doesn't take away any of your humanity. It doesn't take away any of the realness of your life doesn't take away your experiences, doesn't take away your feelings, doesn't take away any of it. It's just, how do I react to the high and how do I react to the low? Rabbi Nachman's teaching you how to do it. Run as fast as you can when you're feeling good. Don't like, okay, now I can relax because finally, like, I was able to pay my bills this month. You know, this girl, like, said she liked me. Um, This thing worked out. And now, oh, finally I can relax. No, that time you need to go push it. But then there's going to come resistance and you're going to get knocked down. The past knockdown meant I let go of the ladder and I came crushing down and I became dysfunctional. Rabbi Nachman says, you can get hurt and you cannot let go of the ladder. You could just hold on for dear life to where you are. And I promise you that that thing that's pressing down on you, it's going to pass. And when it passes, you'll be able to climb up from where you're holding right now, which is rungs up now from the bottom. And you keep doing this and keep doing this and you keep doing this. And that's like a waiting period, the hemten. Yes. And each time you'll see, not each time, like, like it's guaranteed like every single time, but you'll see over the course of time, the way you're responding to the lows is more and more functional. And, and, it's, and it's not, it's not, um, it's less and less destructive. So like for instance, maybe I fall because I come home and I, uh, I uh, said something to my wife like I shouldn't have said. She got upset at me. So maybe in the past I go into this whole spiral in my head about how bad of a person I am, how I keep making this mistake, and how, how do I keep making this? She told me a million times, like, and I see she doesn't want it. I even did it, right? So that, and then what happens? I come home, I'm upset, I feel like I'm a loser, so I don't learn. I feel like I'm a loser, so I don't pray. I don't get up in the morning because of it, right? Because I'm, all of this. That's called falling off the ladder. Rabbi Nachman says, it's okay you made the mistake. Hold on to where you are. What does that mean? Don't catastrophize what's happening right now. Everything is from heaven. This is also from heaven. Hold on to where you are. Now, what would that mean? Maybe that means in the beginning, me like holding on tooth and nail to say to myself, okay, I made a mistake, but I'm still a good person. I made a mistake, but that was me trying the best that I could. And even though I feel guilty about it, and even though my wife is mad at me right now, I'm gonna still do my learning Seder at night, even though I feel like crap and I don't want to. 
And then what you're going to see is you wake up tomorrow and your wife's okay. But you will have learned that night before, even though you felt horrible. And that's the beginning. And you'll see it's like a muscle that you're flexing. And you're able to keep doing it and growing on it and building on it. And then like instead of the bad feelings that I have from the resistance causing me three hours of feeling bad, now it's two hours of feeling bad about myself. And two hours becomes one hour. And the one hour becomes 30 minutes. And the 30 minutes becomes 15 minutes of me feeling bad about myself. And it becomes 10 minutes. becomes one minute. And becomes 30 seconds. And then it becomes like one split moment. I made a mistake? Okay, good. Like Rabbi Nachman says, on to the next. That's called becoming more expert in the lows. But how do you get to the point that you can actually do that? You have to mavatal yourself to the tzaddik. Because there's, you, you there's nothing in your mind, in your heart, that would, that would um, encourage you to not just fall apart. So don't trust yourself. No, <laughs> at all. <laughs> that's, a whole, that's a whole thing. You cannot trust yourself until, like Rabbi Nachman says, you have pure powers of imagination. You get that through the Ruach Kodesh of the Tzaddik. You get that. You get that Ruach Kodesh of the Tzaddik by Makash. What is that called? What? Ruach Kodesh. Ruach Kodesh. Until you have Ruach Kodesh, then you can't trust yourself. No, you have to keep imbibing the Ruach Kodesh of the Tzaddik until your powers of imagination are pure. Any, 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 anything, any idea that I think in me is nachash. And there's no such thing as neutral. It's not like I'm neutral and I'm going to Rabbi Nachman. It's no, I, or Rabbi Nachman or nachash. Or the rage, or afer, or afer. Right, like the Baal Shem Tov said, any time that a Jew doesn't have a, a, a leader, the nachash becomes his leader. So what does that mean simply? That means that am I determining what I'm going to do right now? Or is the Rebbe determining it? If the Rebbe is not determining it, guess what? You're also not determining it. The Nachash is determining it. You don't have a choice. That's what they say, like a Rav. Make yourself a Rav. Because you think to yourself, well, if I don't have a Rav, then I'll be able to do what I want. No, mm-hmm. you won't. You have no. You either make yourself a Rav, or you get Yeshli Rav. Asa. Okay. Okay. Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs>